get started, I'd like to give you a quick tour of my awesome movie studio. Here's the break room where I break bread. You know, food for thought. Here's the conference table where I do most of my writing and thinking, and occasionally the other way around. This is the editing suite where everything comes together. And last but not least, the sound booth. I know it doesn't look like much, but everyone can appreciate the importance of good quality sound in filmmaking. There are two ways to achieve good quality sound. One, renting an expensive sound studio. Or two, for those of us citizen diplomats with real small budgets, building a sound booth from scratch and going under covers. While you're watching the film, I'll be in here busy narrating. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. What do you think of when you hear Iran? Um, I think of the Middle East and oil and the crisis that's happening here and the crisis that's happening over there and bad stuff all together. I think of war. The hostages back in 1979 when uh, the hostages were taken from the U.S. Embassy. I think violence because of the way that the Middle East in general is portrayed in the media. Excuse me, um, would you mind being in a documentary? Um, what is it about? Well, I'm uh, sorry. It's um, I'm doing. I'm just trying to gather interviews. Um, people's uh, general perception of Iran. Iran? Yeah. Wow. Um, I'm actually Iranian. <laughs> really? Sure. Sure. I would love to be in it. Ah, okay. Well, wonderful. Um, okay. Uh, what's the first thing that comes to your mind when you hear Iran? What What's the first thing that comes to your mind? Um. Well, for me, uh, home. I think of a uh, a country very rich in culture. Um. Delicious food, a lot of uh, a lot of beauty in all the different cities of Iran. Filming might be a little bit difficult, especially maybe in the park, trying to find a a, a female to interview. That's not going to be very easy. <laughs> but no. From what I'm hearing is going on with them. I'm hearing they're having a lot of violence, trouble going on. So I, I believe they good people, just like we out here have good people. But you know, we all have our troubles too. Yeah. Este, un gobierno represivo, okay, absolutamente. Uh, un gobierno represivo, un presidente, uh, un dictador, un presidente. And a president. Iran's actions threaten the security of nations everywhere. I mean, that old, uh, that old Beach Boy song, Bomb Iran, you know, <laughs> bomb, bomb, bomb. And Iran's active pursuit of technology that could lead to nuclear weapons threatens to put a region already known for instability and violence under the shadow of a nuclear holocaust. In other words, Iran is more dangerous than Nazi Germany. Could that be possible? Iran more dangerous than Nazi Germany? The same Nazi Germany that instigated the war that killed more than 50 million people worldwide? Wow. Iran sounds like a really dangerous place to visit. No wonder my friends thought it was nuts to consider a trip to Iran. It feels like one of those forbidden places shrouded in mystery. But honestly, are we even talking about the same place? Iran, Persia, the cradle of civilization as a part of the axis of evil? You try to be open-minded, I think that's the thing too. You know, you, to make judgment just because you read the paper, some of them are so slanted. I do think that it, it's necessary for, for people to be more aware of what's going on, and I think that a huge step is to is to have first-hand experience or to be able to see the, the real things that are going on that we don't see in the media here. It's been portrayed in a very negative light, but it's it's not, it's there's so much more to Iran than what is seen on the news. I'd be interested to know like what it's like for people living over there, but pretty much I'd rather just watch it on a video. Well, that settles it. My name is Brendan Hamilton. I'm an American and I'm going to Iran.
wait, can Americans even go to Iran? And once I'm there, will I be able to leave? Or will my camera get confiscated? Will I be held for ransom? Abducted by terrorists? Become a political bargaining chip held in some gulag? No! Introducing Jerry Decker, world travel guide, language extraordinaire, professor of humanities, and the coordinator of our trip. Do you want a confirmation of that? By the way, when did you go to Iran the first time? Well, I went there in 1970. I had a backpack and a baby on my back. And I went off to see the world. You know, we need to learn how to speak Arabic. We need to learn how to speak Persian. We need to learn how to speak the other languages of the Middle East. We need to uh, study the religions of the Middle East. We need to travel to the Middle East. And we need to have people from the Middle East travel over here. Without official diplomatic relations, there are no direct flights between America and Iran. Travelers must go through other neutral countries as midway points. My particular flight connects through Frankfurt, adding several hours to an already lengthy journey. In preparation for our landing in Tehran, the flight crew delivers an unusual announcement. In observance of Islamic laws, they ask all women on board to conceal their hair. Hijab, as it is referred to in many Muslim societies, is more than just headscarves or veils. Its wider meaning speaks to modesty, privacy, and morality. 24 hours after leaving San Francisco, our plane finally touches ground at Tehran's international airport. My senses are on high alert. I feel uneasy filming at the airport. I had been warned about possible serious challenges going through customs. Sure enough, my camera equipment caught the attention of the customs officers. A few revolutionary guards came over, handpicked me out of the crowd. Worried that my trip could end before it begins, I wait and wait some more. Finally, we are cleared and they let us through. Once on the streets, I feel relieved, welcomed by a city decorated with lights, celebrating Iran's independence. Waking up in Tehran, I'm overwhelmed by the city's vastness and the sea of buildings sitting on the slope of the Alborz Mountains. Fifteen million people call this place home. This figure surpasses the populations of New York, Los Angeles, and Chicago combined. I'm still nervous about filming in Iran. I have so many questions and feel unsure how people will react to me and my camera. I'm really curious how Iranians live, how they perceive America, how much do they know about what's going on in other nations and are Islamic teachings and values radically different from those of our own? There is so much to see, so many questions to ask. Hello. Come, travel with me, discover this mystical place. بگو از عشق ای آخرین مشوق که برای رسوایی دنبال بهونم با بوسه ای آروم خوابم رو دستیدی تو شدی تبیر رویای شبونم من تو نگاه تو دنیامو میبینم فردای شیرینم نازنین من چشمای تو افثان که تموم خواب و خیالم بود تقدیر من عشق تو شد 
the perception of Iran that Americans have, I think, is very distorted, very mixed up. It's not accurate at all. Do you have any makeup? Makeup? Uh-huh. No. No? I was born like this. <laughs> 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 Me too. <laughs> Introducing Farzaneh, our Iranian tour guide. She herself is a college graduate. She has a degree in German language. Her English, as you know, is very, very good. So she is one of the top guides for foreigners in Iran. Filming was difficult. Traveling as a student, never having official permission to film, I had to rely on Jerry and Farzaneh's watchful eyes to avoid problems. This holy shrine, in the heart of Tehran, is not a regular stop for most Westerners. But Jerry insisted we must go. I had to be extra careful not to film military or police. The few times there was trouble, Jerry was there to talk his way out of it. Peacefulness permeates this place. Water from the fountain cools the hot air. The head guard came over, a younger man, and he said, do you think that the image they paint of Iran and the USA is a true or false? I said, it's false. He said, okay, go ahead, shoot. Iran boasts a relatively young population. Nearly two-thirds are under the age of 30. What do they think of America and the rest of the world? Their thoughts on current affairs, life, religion? God and this stuff is personal. Hmm. It's not about politics. Hmm. I think that do. I hear you. He is one of the children of the revolution, uh -huh. as they call them. Uh -huh. you know, the, the generation born after the revolution. <laughs> to be able nice to meeting you guys. <laughs> this is for Children our of the revolution. <laughs> Children of the revolution. No, don't call that. Call me a friend, something yeah. like that. <laughs> what is that topic? <laughs> right, right. But it's a term that we hear a lot in the United States. 
for example, the we hear that the children of the revolution are very, um, you know, depressed. You know, the people, the, a lot of the young people are, de you know, depressed, absorbed, yeah, yeah, yes, yes. bigone, mm. absorbed, isolated. Yes, 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 do, you, yes. do you think that's true? Is no. That, you don't yeah. think it's true? <laughs> you don't think they're bigone or, or absorbed? No, of course not. Why not? Because I and my friends, we are not just like that. We know what we are, we know what we want to do. You know, I just think that. Yeah. Mm. And what is that that you want to do? What I want to do. Huh? <laughs> I really always wanted that my father ask this from me. He never do, did that. And because he always make me I'm a, I told you I'm studying civil engineering, but I really didn't like that. It is because of my father. But what I really want to do is to live for myself. I want to live every second of my life. You know, I want to live like that, that this is the last day of my life. You know, just like the rapper said that. You know? <laughs> I, I listen, uh, and one of the reasons that I know a little English is because of rap music. Which, uh, which rapper do you like best? Um, Eminem with his last album <laughs> and Tupac. It, it was great. I mean, it was great. Do a lot of all your friends listen to rap and stuff? No, the uh, rest of my friends, most of them, they listen to electronic music. Uh -huh. Trans, psycho, something like that. But I like rap music. It is my favorite. Do you like the Iranian rap music? Um, we are not that much good in that, but it is not bad. It is getting improved to improve. But I think rap music for Americans. No, everything has got a root. The rap music roots is in America for black people. And it was a, something wondering for all the people that how come Eminem became the <laughs> great rapper. Do you think if you live every minute as if it's your last. What about the future? Yeah. Well, <laughs> you wanted to I'm say that. I'm your father's age. So. <laughs> what about the future? Well, what are you going to do about future? Yeah. You know, it is a really great topic to talk about it, but my English is not that good. Yeah. I hope so. It's fine, it's fine. Um, your English is excellent. <laughs> I'm glad to know that you're not big on it. Big on it? No, I'm not. Why, why should I be, you know? Uh, oh, I look at, I agree with you, I agree. But I'm just saying that, that in a lot of the current studies about social problems You know, I here, think that the whole world is one country. You know, this is how people doing, this line is yours, okay, you're more powerful, this figure is yours. I think all the world is one country. And if I'm not okay in here, so I'm going to move around. I go someplace else. Maybe I'm okay there. And I like to be an adventurer, you know, I like to see every place, every country, you know, because I think every culture has got something to learn to me. And I think, I hope so one day I could have done that. But your country don't give visas. <laughs> <laughs> we are not too good. No, you guys are cool. <laughs> okay. No, if, uh, Every, every video club in Iran have an original movie from Europe or from uh -huh. Uh -huh. No, in English. Not check it before. Right, it hasn't been censored. Yeah, yeah it hasn't uh -huh. been censored, okay. And the police, no, okay. They catch you and have some problems. Really? Yeah, yeah. So it's like a secret club? Yeah, yeah of course. It's because because in all it different culture. It's, yeah. it's better for young people. Uh -huh. And is there many clubs like this around? Yeah, yeah of course. Yeah. It's just because of our religion. Stay in your room. Suddenly, a policeman officer came. Okay, yeah. what is your movie? Do you have uh, bad movies? No, he said no. We check it. What is this? What is this? What is this? Really? Yeah, yeah. In your own house? No, no, no. It's, no. A, it's a shop. It's a, in a shop. shop. Uh -huh. Just, uh -huh. I see, but in the house, it's free. <laughs> but American movies are very nice. Yeah. Especially Jean Claude. Huh? Jean Claude. <laughs> yeah. uh, yeah. Jennifer Lopez. And <laughs> she's not <laughs> that one. <laughs> Angelia Jolie. Yeah, exactly. she's the best. Perfect. Yeah. yeah.
We stay to have tea with some of the local villagers. Even here in this remote part of the country, people impress me with their mature capacity to differentiate between Americans and the American government. Oh, it's very fun. <laughs> yeah. You mean it is better than the thing that they describe in America? Oh, yeah. Really? Of course. <laughs> <laughs> you have, don't I, wish, I wish more Americans could come. Yeah, no, because that's, that, then, um, that's important. Uh, we don't have any problem with the people of America, but uh, I think we have some problem with the well, government. So do we. we. We also have problems with the government. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Everybody. You yeah, have we don't with like your uh, government or uh, no, us? No, our all government. <laughs> all governments. All governments. <laughs> Uh, he's going to show us his, uh, his house in the second floor there. Okay. Very good. Okay, 50 meters, we'll go back. Yes. Okay. Okay. We drove all the way here. Go ahead. So go inside and see them. Hello. So, my daughter, sister. <laughs> Interviewing women is not well received in most parts of Iran. Embedded in the culture is a deep protectiveness and respect of women, contrary to many Westerners' preconceptions. I had to be careful not to overstep my boundaries and directly approach women for my interviews. I'm fortunate to have Jerry guide me along this sensitive cultural tightrope. Jerry, we ask them what they think about Americans. Jerry, did all you guys. Nah, I'm always trying to create a bad thing. Persian cuisine varies from region to region. Most dishes consist of rice and a variety of kebabs or stews what Iranians call khoresh. Persian cuisine is famous for its rich flavors and aroma. Everywhere I travel, I'm struck by the warm sense of hospitality in Iran. We are greeted kindly by everyone we meet. Our journey takes us to a traditional Persian gymnasium, Zor Khone, literally translated, House of Strength. The low, narrow doorway obligates all who enter to bow down, symbolizing the need for humility. 
even kings, princes, and presidents must humbly bow to enter this spiritual house of strength. Most Iranians, you know, are very much, you know, into poetry. Poetry is an important part of their life. Many poets, even in the West, will agree that poetry is a kind of spiritual language. I mean, it may be even a higher form of language than just prose or just, just, just speech. The fact that you engage in poetry, this almost requires that you enter a higher realm of communication that can, I think, humanize you more and bring you more in touch with what I consider some of the important principles of, of, of creation, some of the important principles of being human. I really like to speak English. Actually, I try to translate Persian poems into English with Persian rhythm. In Persian, we say, A friend is a friend who takes the hand of a friend. Whenever he is happy or unhappy, no difference. Hello, yo, ayuhal, ayuhas sawi, adel kasan wana will ha, kesh kawasan nemuda fal, vali mufta mushkil ha. At first sight, love, love uh, seemed to be easy, but uh, after that, uh, when you fell in love. It got very, very, very difficult, and it needs uh, to be patient a lot. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
And you always loved them as a kid, your son? Yes, I love them. I mean, since even when I was 13 or 14 years old, I read Khayyam's uh, poem. Khayyam, I say, if you see it, you know, if you are intoxicated with the wine, okay, no problem, be happy, it's a kind of happiness. And if you are sitting with a, you know, beautiful lady, okay, no problem, be happy. And because the end of the world is something which is finished, now, as you are alive, be happy and don't worry. Yes, that's it. In every life you expect troubles, and if you worry, you make them double. So be happy. Don't worry. <laughs>
sunglasses, <laughs> everything. And if you have no money, never mind. You have a good credit card here. <laughs> you, can get, you can get all the cards and you can send the money from America to us almost. And uh, also, we have this shipping service for you. Okay? We can carry it to the hotel. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely not his first sales pitch. You're in it now. No. Yeah, I'm <laughs> I'm in a documentary film. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Actually, the left Iran before revolution, uh -huh. they have got very good life there. Yeah. Very good. Oh, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, Running San Jose is nice. Yeah. Did you like it? Yeah. I like it. Yeah. It's really nice. Yeah. Nice to meet you. You too. Have a nice day. deceased person in the mosque and the artificial flower the people to show respect to the family of the dead so they come and put instead of artificial flower this instead of natural flower they buy this from an organization for the poor you know to help them and after the ceremony they take it after the ceremony they take it they take it to the organization oh so they get to reuse it yes Listen. 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 Look, watch what I'm doing. I guess so. Yes? Yeah. No. They're fitting, they're fitting the, uh, the tiles. They're making the tiles. They're fitting them according to love. And then after they're dried, then they paint them. The official religion of Iran is Shiism one of the two main denominations of Islam. Unlike most other Islamic nations, where Sunni Muslims dominate the population, in Iran, 90% of the people are Shia Muslims. To better understand Shiism, we travel to Qom, the educational and philosophical center of Shia Islam. Water is not big of a... You can't breathe properly. Nothing is good, except Education is very solid. So I would predict that maybe in the next 10 or 20 years, you're going to find a growth of Shia Islam among Muslims, especially in places like the West. The generation that was here going back and doing work. Shia Islam is a very much um, unknown Islam in the world, and surprisingly so, because Shia Islam goes all the way back to the time of the Prophet. With approximately 1.5 billion adherents, Islam represents the second largest organized religion in the world. Second only to Christianity, nearly all Muslims belong to either the Sunni or Shia denominations. Iranians are very proud of the scientific and cultural advancements attributed to Shia polymaths, scholars, and visionaries. Another characteristic about Shia Islam is that it is very intellectual, it has a very strong intellectual streak. In Iran especially, Islamic philosophy tended to flourish. Not only did it, did it tend to flourish, but it developed a new uh, approach, a new form, a form that combined both mysticism and rational speculation. Islam is seen to be the culmination of all religions. Religion is one. Muslims do not see themselves as the only uh, custodians 
of the only truth. Islam sees truth everywhere and in everything. Unfortunately, in the West, people don't have access to the reality of Islam. They are looking at a particular presentation of Islam. And I remember when the Berlin Wall came down, there was a big debate in NATO as to now why should NATO continue to exist, right? And among the people who were justifying the uh, continued existence of NATO, I think it was the Spanish uh, uh, Prime Minister who said the next enemy is going to be Islam, right? And so you find that in this time right now, what they are actually doing is trying to cultivate the Islamic enemy in order to justify the biggest land slash oil grab in history. So yes, with respect to the interests of imperialism, Islam is the enemy. It's a fact. But with respect to innocent people, Islam is not the enemy. Islam is a friend. Islam uh, aims to guide us to realize our real true destiny. And what is that destiny? That we are the representatives of God on the face of this earth. We are the representatives of God on the face of this earth. Iran's 1979 Islamic Revolution heightened the stature of the mullahs. At Khan Seminary, we meet mullahs dedicated to keeping alive the spirit of the revolution. Iran's present-day theocracy is unprecedented in its history. The Islamic Revolution of 1979 transformed Iran from a monarchy under the Shah to an Islamic Republic under Ayatollah Khomeini, in effect ending the 2,500-year reign of Persian kings. Shah of Iran left his country today on a vacation from which he may never return. <laughs> Greetings to you, Khomeini, they chanted, surging toward him, desperate to touch the hand or robe of the holy man, or to have something, anything, touched and blessed by him. To touch him, one man said, is to touch the person who speaks to God. 
He demanded that the government resign at once or face arrest, and that foreigners, especially Americans, get out. <laughs> What a rare experience to be invited into a woman's house. This is, this is, very, this is very unique. Never before. These clergy men are Shia Muslims. Uh, what they were trying to do when we were visiting here was to explain the spiritual connection between Iran and Iraq. And of course, it is in Iraq where you have two of the major. Uh, uh, holy sites of the Shia Muslims. One is Karbala and one is Najaf. On our way to the Caspian Sea, we make an unexpected stop for ice cream and drinks. The timing is perfect. Kids are just finished with school for the day and my camera catches their attention. <laughs> I'm from Talish. How do you speak such good I go to class and then I learn. America, yeah? <laughs> what they wanted to know, it was not political at all, in no way, and of course this always happens because when, when they find out that I have a history here, then there's the perennial question, you know, what was it like before the revolution? They were, those guys were most, I think they were all from the Caspian Sea. And they wanted to know what was it like before the revolution. And I said, well, men and women went together, swimming together, having parties, you know, drinking parties, uh, music. I mean, it was a, you know, the North, you know, the Shah used to go up there and play around, and the royal family, and it was quite a place. I wasn't going to tell them that I used to go skinny dipping in the Caspian. <laughs> but, but actually, we did, we did. Hey, hi. What do you think about this place? Ah, uh, it reminds me of the old time. That's what <laughs> I was thinking, it's like old ghosts in yeah. here, huh? <laughs> I can't do this, this is Lobby. Lobby. Ground floor. Uh, it reminds me of the 1970s. Yeah, I thought. <laughs> and it's like everybody left and everything came back. And all of a sudden, do you know what happened? I had this strange feeling of nostalgia, yeah. which I haven't felt in a long time, being <laughs> back. But I had this feeling of nostalgia, and I had these flashbacks to when I was here in the 70s and, and coming to places like this. And it was a big opening here, big fanfare, and this was deluxe that everybody came down here. And it's like big parties. I know, because, because like the swimming pool out here where men and women were out there with their bikinis and, <laughs> and then the bars and the discos. And it's all coming back, Jerry. It's all coming back, <laughs> and now it's just whoop. Oh, 
Takte Saliman, the throne of King Solomon, an ancient fire temple, these fortress walls protected flames that burned from natural gas and enclosed both hot springs and a great crater lake. Mongols, Arabs, Romans, Persians, Turks, all fought for control of the strategic mountain pass. But now, peacefully, it sits forgotten. The eternal flames burn no longer, but the sacred words of Zoroaster are still spoken. Introducing Ozzy. Some 60 years ago, he excavated this site with German archaeologists. They were in search of their Aryan past. Over 90 years old today, he still guides travelers around the ruins. If, if somebody speaks well, thinks well, and behaves well, he doesn't see the fire in the hell. He doesn't go to hell according to his words. He's repeating the lessons of Zoroaster. The sacred text from Zoroaster. Think well. Speak well, do well. He was asking you first, when he was asking you whether you know the importance of fire in this religion, and he didn't wait and he answered himself because the fire is the, I mean, so the light, the holy light coming from sky, and of course, I mean, so the best creation of God as he believes. The light coming from the sky, and of course the fire, you mean. Yeah. Makes, makes this, this world, I mean, lightened, you know. While they were praying, uh, they were worshipping here, if they wished something from their heart because of the fire, because of the light, it made your heart, you know, believe in God, and uh, so everything came true. If you wish something from your heart, it would come true. Mm -hmm. Everything that I start, every work that I start, I will be successful. Iranians are proud of their rich history. They travel from every corner of their homeland to pay homage to their ancient past. Friends, Mohammed. Mohammed. Mohammed, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. What do you guys think? It's so magnificent, yeah. perfect. Yeah. Terrific, something unusual, really. It's Have you amazing. ever seen such a thing in your life? No. I've never seen it, really. It's really crazy. This is like a dream come true to come here. It really drives me crazy, real nice. Perfect. Are you guys from around here? Are what? you guys from here? No. We're just from, uh, coming from Tehran, but... Oh, uh, Tehran, yeah. yeah. What about you? Uh, from America. Oh, good. Yeah, this has been an amazing trip. Yeah. It's so beautiful. The more than beautiful. Yeah, more, the more words don't beautiful, describe, huh? Beautiful cannot describe this work. Yeah. What a shot. <laughs> Persepolis. Built more than 2,500 years ago, it stands as an enduring tribute to an advanced ancient empire. It was here that the Persian king, Cyrus the Great, set in stone the world's first human rights charter. The liberties inscribed on the Cyrus Cylinder predate 
by more than a millennium, the Magna Carta, the inspiration behind the British and American constitutions. For centuries, the kings of Persia reigned supreme. Processions of people from every corner of the known world would come to pay homage to the Persian kings. Walking through the ruins and rubble, staring up at the crumbling statues, it's so natural to reflect on how empires and the statues and monuments that exalted them are all bound for one destiny, to fracture, crumble, and inevitably turn to dust. Yeah, I'm um, with the tour group. Uh, where's your tour group? Um, all around. Okay. Yeah. How is America today? Uh, it's nice. I live in San Francisco. Do you know Bay Area? Um, but it's nice to come to Iran. Yeah. It's amazing. Of course, it's very good for me to come there, but it's very hard. Yeah, I it's know. In Persepolis, I meet a young Iranian engineer. I ask what he thinks of President Bush. It's not bad, of course. He's very powerful. Yeah. And he likes to be powerful. Yeah. So. Of course. I'm learning, I'm, I'm learning English and uh, I have learned English for, I have been learning English yeah. for uh, four years. Uh -huh. And it is very good time to speak with you because yeah. I'm improving my yeah, speaking yeah. English. Well, your English is very good. Uh, thank you very much. Much thank better you. than my Persian. <laughs> Some of my friends told me, that, you know, to be really safe. Yeah, uh, but I think that Iranian people don't like these things. <laughs> like we, like other people, they like to be they like to have peace yeah. with other people, with American people, your friend. Yeah. And it is not necessary for us to be enemies. Yeah. Okay? I think they have changed the people's, other people's, foreign people's, foreign theories of... Their ideas. Yeah, they, yeah. they have changed their ideas. Of course, they are not, they are not Iranian people like these that they say. I mean, everyone I've met has been really, really nice. And open, you know. Hello, you know, you're from yeah. America. Hi. They like the American people, mm, even England people. Okay? <laughs> they like to have a peace. They like peace. Yeah. Okay? They like peacefully war. I mean, Iranian, they have kept their culture. If you remember, I mean, although the country has been occupied by Mongol, by Arab, by Turks, by different, <laughs> different group of people, but always making me think about, I mean, so our people, and makes me feel that I love my country, I mean, better than, I mean, so some other places because of my job, I have opportunity of, you know, traveling to different countries, staying there, but I always thinking about the country because people, they have kept their relationship, you know. I mean, why, what do you say, close relationship between the families in Iran is interesting for me. I mean, when there is a party, you never find one or two persons. There is a group of people, ten people. When there is a holiday, going to a restaurant, going to, I mean, some some parts you will you will you will never find one person sitting alone. Always five, six, seven people, and it's interesting for me. You never feel alone here. But as I have heard, and according to I mean, so nine years of working in this job, I have seen people coming here, and they are alone. I mean, they are living with their cats, with their dogs. I mean, they are talking about how beautiful my cat is. But here, I mean, every every Friday. So I'm calling my brother, or he's calling me. I mean, he has four children, and it's about 40 minutes that because he's living far from me, six hours driving. So we're always talking together, and I know, I mean, so about my nephews, about my nieces. I mean, they always, I mean, talking about me. I mean, so the, the friends they know about my my nephews and nieces, and their friends they know about me. <laughs> but I have never heard somebody coming here and talking about his nephew. Yeah, you know, yeah. you know it's, it's interesting. Yeah.
the family unit is it's like family it's totally relation. important. Yes, yes, it's important. And that's Persian culture? Or? Yes, this is Persian culture. Yes, exactly. And for this reason, I mean, so I have never seen people, I mean, so coming to Iran and they feel that they don't like Iranian. Because there's like a culture of just being uh, really sensitive to everyone else, kind of. Yeah. And also, I mean, so because we don't have many tourists, I mean, and it's in culture, in, in, in Iranian culture. Let me tell you, for example, if you, if you, in a hot summer, when you are, when you decide to, I mean, drink a glass of cold water and somebody's sitting beside you, whether you know him or not, first you invite, first you ask him to drink and then you eat. And this is in our Iranian culture. You never, in a, so showing your back to another person and eating your chocolate. But I have seen, <laughs> I have seen among some of the groups that they are sitting because they are alone. It's illegal to sing in public in Iran. America's possible invasion of Iran looms over everyone's mind. At times it mystifies me how their friendliness towards me could exist amidst this fear and anxiety. In this atmosphere we visit Biheshti Zara, a vast martyr cemetery. Martyrdom is considered a very important form of spiritual practice because martyrdom means that you to, to testify for the religion by spilling your blood you actually purify the religion so martyrdom is a very important aspect of spiritual practice because it's the blood of the martyrs that purifies Islam through history And you'll see, for example, pictures all over of these martyrs, shahids they are called. These are people who gave their lives to the revolution. The younger ones, many of them, would go into the minefields and they would walk through mines on purpose to blow themselves up so that the tanks could cross and fight the Iraqi army. Shortly after Iran's 1979 Islamic Revolution, Iraq invaded Iran with a preemptive strike to seize control of a strategic waterway along the border of the two countries. With the help of the U.S., Soviet Union, France, and England, Saddam Hussein had hoped for a swift victory against an Iran in turmoil, a major miscalculation on his part. Initially overwhelmed by the massive invading force, Ayatollah Khomeini called on his people to join God's army. Iranians united and answered the call. Some as young as 13 went to the front lines to defend their border. An estimated one million lives were lost during this eight-year brutal and bloody Iran-Iraq war.
this young boy was 20 years old when he was a revolutionary commander. One of the ways in which people are changed is that they go into the reality of Iran and they start doubting themselves. They start thinking about their own capacity to think critically. To my surprise, wherever I traveled in this country, I was greeted with kindness and warmth. Despite the vast differences in language, traditions, and lifestyles, I feel an extraordinary bond with the people here. Not only affects the way they think about Iran, but they begin to think about other things in life. In other words, Iran, a trip to Iran serves as a kind of a, of a catalyst that gets people to think more seriously. You go through uh, about their own way in which they approach the world, how they form their perceptions of the world. So I think that if, if somebody gets nothing from Iran, you know, culturally, spiritually, or whatever, at least it shocks them into reevaluating their own way of looking at life, looking at the world. And of course, that kind of, I think, encourages them to refine their own skills of critical thinking that they can employ not only to Iran, but also to the world in general. That's probably my major goal in bringing people over there. Happy birthday to me. The man who is going to play drum and singing, this man, this guy, ah, he's the he's singer. singer. Yes, or oh, his voice.
It has been an unforgettable trip. I entered this country nervous and apprehensive about what lay ahead. Tonight I am struck yet again by the irresistible warmth of the Iranian people. I traveled to Iran thinking I might find the so-called axis of evil lurking behind every corner. Instead, I discovered a different axis altogether, one of culture and humanity. A deeply humanistic spirituality permeates this culture. There is a reverence for rich poetic tradition, countless architectural treasures, and exulting landscapes. Although thousands of miles away from my home, I feel I'm among friends and family here. Making me feel at home, they threw me a birthday party, great food, live music, even a birthday cake. Being back home feels different. I feel more empowered, more connected with everything around me. I wish more people could share in this experience. What a pity that more Americans don't have easy access to Iran's charisma, and that Iranians have similar difficulties accessing ours. Throughout my journey, I felt like a citizen diplomat, interacting with Iranians, who were naturally gifted as goodwill ambassadors themselves. I could only hope that this new form of diplomacy might take hold in many others and bear unexpected fruit. Hi. Brandon, right? Brandon, yeah. Brandon. Yeah, please sit down. Yeah. Uh, so, how is the film going? Uh, it's well. It's going well. I, in fact, I went to Iran and traveled around, filmed. Oh wow! Interviews. Where did you go? Tell me. Um, well, actually, I went to uh, Shiraz, Isfahan, oh, Ardabil, Tehran. Yeah, I saw the did Caspian. You, did you go to Paris of Police? Yeah, it was amazing. Beautiful. Did you? Oh, so much culture, so much yeah, art. History. It's my favorite city in Iran. Yeah, it was. It was amazing. Wow. You speak uh, Farsi, right? Yeah, of course. And you like Persian music? I love it. Yeah. yeah? When I was when I was traveling there, I got this song and I just can't stop listening to it. It's pretty amazing. I, give it a try. Tell me what you think. Wow, it's really beautiful. Do you understand what he's saying? Uh, I have no idea. Well, he's actually talking about his love and the the way that he sees the world through her eyes. They're very beautiful lyrics. It's a really pretty song. Yeah, it's amazing. It's amazing to find out what the lyrics mean. Nice dear Judy. Don't you think so? What? One day all the dreams of Iranian about having peace, about I mean so a world without any war will come true. Huh? I hope so. Oh, 
که تموم خواب و خیالم بود تقدیر من عشق تو شد که همیشه فکر محالم بود شبهای تنهایی هم رنگ گی 